Hi, everybody. Hi. The, um, the gospel set for today is uh, something I've never preached on before. Uh, so I felt challenged to preach on it, uh, not least because of all that's going on in the life of the world around us. I felt moved that now is the time to tackle it. So if you have the first one, please, Ken. The question that I guess has been posed to me more often than any other in my ministry is, how can you believe in God when? And just look at what's been going on in the world around us. We've got the absolute outrage in two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, where worshippers were gunned down. We've got the Ethiopian Airlines Boeing 737 MAX 8 disaster. We've got the teenagers killed in a disco in Ireland. We've got Cyclone Idai with hundreds dead and more to die as cholera takes hold. And we've got Libby Squire, the student from Hull, uh, whose death is now being treated as homicide. And all of these, and so many more, ask and pose the question, how do we believe in God and make sense of this when all of this is happening? And the gospel speaks right into that, the gospel set for today. Let me tell you a story. Uh, the summer of 1987, I think I was about 28 or 29, you can do the math. Um, I was the end of my first year training in Cambridge for the ministry, and I went on placement to the Bishop Stortford circuit uh, with a lovely superintendent called Harold. And one of the things Harold did, he was a hospital chaplain. And the first time I wore one of these and a suit like this was when I went with Harold into the Hearts and Essex Hospital. And we went into a side ward, and there in the bed was a four-year-old girl, riddled with cancer, dying, with her mum sitting at the bedside, holding her hand. And in that moment, I had never felt so useless, so helpless, so impotent. I had no words to say when confronted by the tragedy that I was witnessing. And so I drove back up the M11 to Cambridge, raging, really raging, angry, furious. And I remember the phrase, please don't be shocked, but I will be honest with you. I wasn't safe to drive, really. I was so angry, trembling at the wheel. And I just looked up and I shouted and I said, and I remember the words as though it were yesterday, you bastard, how can you make a world in which this can happen? I was so angry that this child should be dying. And then spent the next two years trying to work out how I could speak of God and how to wrestle with a world such as we live in. And one of my real bet noirs could well be your favourite harvest hymn. We plough the fields and scatter. What does it say? How's it going? Yeah. By God's almighty hand. He. And the next bit, the chorus. All good things around us are sent from heaven above. So praise the Lord. Yes, praise the Lord for all his love. And I was so vexed and, and angry and puzzled uh, that I wrote this. And the next one, Ken. Because that's the question. How do we speak of love when there is so much tragedy and death all around us? And the image I have, and it's a very Methodist one, is of a pint of Guinness. <laughs> and by my reckoning, there is a nine to one ratio. There is one part froth for nine parts dark beneath the surface, roughly. And yet in life we spend so much time, and in church, with the froth. With that one part which is okay, in where we got together, and it's good, and it's fine. But actually most of us live 
beneath the surface where it is dark and it is threatening and it is a struggle and it is difficult. And it's there that we need to find ways of how we speak about God and where God is. And is God responsible or is there another way we can speak of the God who is present amongst us? Next one, Ken. And the answers that I came to on my journey, I can sum them up, if you will, in some images. So here is Coventry Cathedral, obliterated, uh, one November night in 1940. And in the midst of that obliteration, there is now a statue of Jesus, hands wide open, feeding people. It's the feeding of the 5,000. It was originally, the original is at Blundell School in Devon. It was made by an 18-year-old student uh, at the school, Alan John. When he was 23, he was a navigator in the RAF and he was shot down and killed. And the school presented a new cast of the statue to Coventry Cathedral in his memory. And there it stands at the heart of the devastation and destruction. We have an image of Jesus reaching out to hold, to be present, to be amongst. At the very heart of the pain, we see Jesus. Next one, if we could, Ken. And if you go into the cathedral, that's the Gethsemane Chapel. But what's it framed by? A crown of thorns. There you see the place of hope, the table of love, the place of brokenness where bread and wine is offered for the healing of the world and you don't get to it and you can't see it unless you look at it through the crown of thorns which tells us how deep and how vast and how wide is God's Agony and God's love and God's suffering presence with us at the heart of the pain. That God isn't causing the pain, but God is there at its heart, taking it upon himself in Jesus, crucified, brutalised, murdered. God present at the heart of it all. The love that will not let us go. The next one, Ken, if we could. And then tucked away behind a little window in the cathedral is this cross made of the famous Coventry nails which came from the roof. They held up the slates on the roof and the roof timbers. And after the war they were made into crosses as a sign of reconciliation. And that's the clue. That in all that is wrong, in everything that challenges us, in all the pain and the struggle, God is present seeking to bring it all back to himself. And the image that I have, which helps me, is that of God birthing creation in the same way that a parent gives birth to a child. And if you're a parent, you know that love, you know that bond, you know how vulnerable that feels when your child has their own life, their own being. You have brought them into the world and they are who they are and you would do anything to stop them feeling pain, wouldn't you? You would take it upon yourself. You would give your life to save them, wouldn't you? And that's what God has done. God's reaching out into the heart of the creation he loves to bring it back to him that his love would hold and heal and bring us close. And there's the charred cross they have at the back of the cathedral. It's on the stairs, sort of tucked away, whereas actually it should be really prominent. Charred roof timbers put in the shape of a cross to show us where we find God in a world like this of tragedy and pain and hurt and struggle. God is at the heart of it. God does not cause it. But God is there at the heart seeking to bring creation, this hurting creation, back to himself, to the heart of eternity. The next one, Chris, if we could. Uh, Ken, sorry. 
So in Luke 13, we, we have this extraordinary passage. And some people want to challenge Jesus, and they say to him, look, there were these Galilean pilgrims in Jerusalem, and Pontius Pilate and his soldiers had them butchered. It sounds really contemporary, doesn't it? As though it could be in today's news, because it's always in today's news, this sort of brutality. And they really want an answer. And Jesus knows this, and he says, look, do you think they deserved it? Do you think they were singled out? Do you think that they were worse than anybody else because they suffered this terrible death? Do you think God was responsible? Is this what God wants? And to all of those questions, Jesus gives a very clear answer, which is what? Of course not. One of the most important answers he gives to all the tragedy, to all the pain, to all the struggle, to all the hurt, to all the tears. Do you, do you think they deserved it? Is this what God wants? No, of course not. And then he says something that is absolutely critical. And he says, and what really matters most to all of us, and bearing in mind life expectancy at this time was not great, He's saying, look, what really, really matters to all of us in a world like this is that we turn to God, we give our lives to God, that we open ourselves and we let him change us. Because this is about eternal life. This is about forever. This is about eternity. Jesus is looking at eternity and he's looking at these people and he knows that God loves them so much. What God wants is to bring them back to him. And he said, look, if you turn away from God, that is eternal death. You'll be lost, but turn. Accept his love and his welcome, his forgiveness, and there is eternal life. Our home is eternity. Next one, if we could, Ken. God bringing creation back to God. That's the pattern. Next one, Ken. So then Jesus, having heard the question and the challenge about the pilgrims then turns to something which sounds equally contemporary because he knows it's what's on their mind. He knows it's what they're talking about. That a building has collapsed, 18 people are dead, and he says to them, well, were they extraordinarily bad? Were they worse than anybody else? Did they deserve it? And what does he say? Of course not. And he says, of course not. Because he knows what God is thinking and feeling about that tragedy. He knows God's heart breaks at such tragedies. And that what God wants is just people to know his love and to come home to him. God does not cause it. And in Jesus, God is there, present at the heart of it, saying, look, wake up, change direction. Just give your lives to God. And know that eternal security. Next one, Ken, if we could. God is bringing creation back to God. Can you see it? You see what God is doing from the heart of the pain, bringing it back to God? Next one, Ken. And then he tells, and this is for you, Dave, as you ask the question. He then tells this parable in response to those two tragedies. This is his, his answer. And it's that fig tree, and it's produced nothing, and it really matters where you place God in this drama, in this dialogue. It's really key. If you default to God being the person who planted it, then you end up with an image of God which is vastly different to the image you get if God is the vineyard keeper, don't you? Which is truer to your picture of God? To me, this comes alive and burns with hope when you realise that what's going on here is Jesus is counterpointing the way the world looks at each and every person 
and denies them their value in this context, in this time. People get butchered, remember. He's looking at how people are just not valued as the beautiful image of God that they are. And he is saying God is like the vineyard keeper who always, always says, give it another chance. That's true to Scripture, to what we see in Jesus, who plunges into the pain and the hurt to give us another chance, to keep giving us another chance because he loves us. He goes to a cross and he's crucified to give us that extra chance to show us where love is to be found. Keep giving another chance. God will not want to cut the tree down or us, but God loves us so much, God plunges in alongside. Next one, Ken. You get the message now? This is about God at the heart of creation and the pain and the struggle, bringing it back to God because God is love. And this is what love does. Love is vulnerable. Love expends itself. Love gives everything to bring the beloved back to God. Next one, Ken. So what are our resources for believing this? Well, if we turn to the New Testament in 1 John, what are we told? Simple, isn't it? God is love. And love doesn't inflict harm. Love does not hurt. Love does not cause disaster. Love does not want us to struggle. But love is there alongside us. Do you know, the next moment I felt powerless and helpless was when we left our eldest, Becky, at university, when she was 18. And we took the car, Sue and I, and all her stuff, however we got it in, I don't know, but at that stage, it was a big four by four, and it took a lot. And we put it into this impossibly small room in a hall of residence, and then we had to leave her and come away. And as we drove away, we were both in tears. I don't mind admitting I was, because that was the first time that I wasn't able to protect her and be there, and I felt vulnerable at just leaving her there. And that's the vulnerability of God, isn't it? The vulnerability at the heart of the struggle. God is there loving us and wanting the best for us. And go back to Isaiah. Just read that sentence together. Now, unlike Brexit, that isn't time limited. (laughs) There's no conditional clause on that. That is true for all time and all eternity. From now until forever. That is true. That's how much God loves us. And God wants us. And God cherishes us. And God is there in our pain and in our fear, in our struggle and in our loss, saying, look, you are mine forever. And what are we promised in John 3, 16? What are we going to have? Eternal life. The one who struggles alongside us and loves us and is with us, and we see this in Jesus, is the one who on Easter day we see rise above death and defeat it, and who comes to us from the heart of eternity to say, We are coming back to God. Next one, Ken. And then Jesus giving us that promise that he's prepared a place for us and he will come and take us so that where he is, we will be. We cannot be separated from his love. It is there for us. It is our destiny. And then on Easter Day, from the other side of death, Jesus breaks in. So all that would defeat us and hold us back and destroy us and says, peace be with you. From the heart of eternity, he shows us that there is nothing love cannot face. Next one, Ken. You get the message? God is bringing creation back to God every 
single moment. Next one, Ken. Because this is what God is like. This is how much God loves us. This is what God wants for us. And you're not going to say that to somebody you want to hurt, are you? You say that to somebody you cherish and who is infinitely precious and for whom you give your life and everything you have. Next one, Ken. Come even closer. My words will give you life and a promise of my enduring presence and support. Next one, Ken. And this is brilliant in this translation. God has made you beautiful. So look in the mirror and see yourself and see that that love which goes through death to find you is the love that cherishes you and which calls you beautiful. So seek him, turn to him, Turn to Jesus, accept his presence and his love because his forgiveness is inexhaustible. And at the heart of all that is wrong, he will bring you home. Next one, Ken. And what does that last sentence say as a promise? That God can be trusted absolutely and forever. Forever. We have nothing to fear in everything, through everything, despite everything. He's with us, loving us and holding us. And Ken, thank you. God is and will always bring creation back to God. And thank you, Ken. So I leave you with that as we come to this table. We come to this table through the framing of the crown of thorns, all the pain and the hurt that we bring, we bring it to this table, to the one who comes to us from the heart of eternity because he loves us, the one who shed his tears, who died on a cross, who gave everything he had to give for you and me. We come to this table and meet him once more. Thanks be to God.